Oh, hi there. This is M.P. Fitzgerald, author of A Happy Bureaucracy, and I'm pretending to play the jazz piano. You know, advertisements were invented by the devil to make Ayn Rand happy, (laughs) and no one wants to make Ayn Rand happy. But audio production is expensive. So to keep commercials off this podcast, I've got all three ebooks in the Happy Bureaucracy series rolled into one for the price of a single book, which honestly is the best way to support this podcast. Just check the description for a link and tell your friends about the crazy shit you have been listening to to have less friends. Thanks. And now, for something completely different. A Happy Bureaucracy by M.P. Fitzgerald Narrated by Gary Bennett Author's note Strewn between drug use, groin malice, and cursing on a level tantamount to sacrilege are gratuitous mentions of bureaucracy. These bureaucratic references may not be for the weak of heart. Chapter 5 Arthur's new enforcer looked like someone who was suspiciously not the best for the job. Oh, she looked like she could handle herself in a fight, so that would not be a problem. And based on her worn, custom gear, it looked like she was definitely not someone to fuck with. But what set off Arthur's internal alarms was the copious amount of cursing and yelling she was doing at the van master along with the two cigarettes she was smoking simultaneously in a no-smoking zone. It was hard to tell from the other side of the van bay, but one of the cigarettes looked like it was filled with something other than tobacco. Almost silently, Arthur began to cross the bay. The van master was cowering at the flying spittle from the enforcer's yelling. Arthur could not hear what the mouse-like van master had just said, but his enforcer's words were loud and clear. You goddamn swine! You hear me, you unconscionable bastard? Those supplies are necessary. Necessary for the very survival of our mission. You have doomed us, you hateful pig bastard! The van master looked helplessly around him, hiding his head behind a clipboard at the abuse being volleyed at him. Her voice carried and echoed well in Bay 13. It was a cavernous-like enclosure, an area that was likely older than the bunker. This was the underground parking level of the old IRS building, and a generation after the building was mostly leveled as it was still full of vehicles. The exception was that the parking lot was now used as a repair shop instead of for parking. There were about a dozen white minivans on this floor, all of them identical to the one leased to Arthur earlier that day, lined up in an orderly fashion. Work should have been done on a few of them now, but the mechanics had paused all of them looking curiously at the scene Arthur's enforcer was making. The van master clocked Arthur and beckoned him over with a desperate tone. Are you Arthur McDowell, census ticker number 824? Arthur winced at his new title. Yes, that's me, he answered. What seems to be the problem? The enforcer grabbed Arthur's hand, her grip cold and firm. With eye contact, she shook his hand enthusiastically. Her demeanor was as cool now as it was hot just seconds ago. If Arthur hadn't seen it, he would have not thought her capable of such white-hot rage. Rabia, Rabia Duke, enforcer, she said. It's good to see a man who looks reasonable in this godforsaken hellscape. Even godforsaken hellscape was said at a level that sounded rational, nothing like the cursing a moment ago. Rabia released Arthur's hand and lay back against a white van. Her dark brown skin appeared darker than it was in the poor light, and despite the darkness in Bay 13, aviator sunglasses covered her eyes. Her militant clothing was worn and old, likely scavenged, her shorts doing nothing to hide the many scars covering her legs. Rabia Duke smelled permanently of cigarettes and dust, but the acrid smell of tobacco was stronger due to her lips holding both a cigarette and something else like a cigarette, both in one corner of her mouth. Her thick and kinky hair was stuffed under a military cap, the word professional written on it in permanent marker. 
A shotgun, which was almost bigger than her frame, was held securely behind her with a strap over her shoulders. It was the only weapon that Arthur could see, though he suspected she had more hidden in her many pockets. It was spray-painted red with the phrase, fly swatter, etched chaotically along its barrel in long scratches. Though Arthur was a full three inches taller than Rabia, he got the sense that she was looking down at him. He would probably find her attractive if she wasn't so intimidating. This weird Nazi car salesman here wants us dead. He can't be reasoned with. I tried, said Rabia through the two smokes in her mouth. She wants some unorthodox equipment that we cannot provide, the van master pleaded. Rabia prodded her finger at the van master's chest accusingly. Unorthodox, she said. We are going into unknown territory, you geek. You can't tell us what's unorthodox if you can't tell us what we'll find out there. Good God, man, have some sympathy for the damned. At that, she drew in a heavy amount of smoke, crossed her arms, and looked away. These are bad omens on the horizon, cowboy, she said to no one in particular. Work in the garage started up again, albeit a bit reluctantly. Eyes still leered at the trio from suspicious corners, but otherwise Bay 13 was back to its usual heartbeat. The van master handed Arthur a clipboard. This is the manifest for your journey that was obtained from the deputy commissioner of operations desk. You are to receive a week's worth of water for two, a week's worth of canned rations and dry rations, mostly spam and instant mashed potatoes, a water recycling kit, two shovels, and camping gear. It says nothing about drugs, sir. Robbie Duke launched herself off of the van and towards the van master, her finger at his chest and her face only a couple of inches from his. You rat bastard! How is a professional supposed to do her job without rum? Without whiskey? Most of what I gave you was a wish list, sure. I can supply my own screamers. And if you don't have the pound of grass in those giant stores of yours, that's fine. Hell, I don't even trust you to know the difference between a psilocybin and a shiitake mushroom. But god damn it, man, a professional needs that alcohol. The van master took a step back, but Robbie had quickly closed the gap and pushed her finger into his chest as hard as she could. And we'll need those grapefruits for the scurvy. I told you, ma'am, you can buy that alcohol at her wares store if need be. But buy? Buy them? I'm a patriot, you swine. These things should come stocked in that goddamn minivan. There's no way I can afford your wares anyway. You selfish bastards hike up your prices too high for anyone without a employee discount. And despite the fact that I have been contracted... Contracted, ma'am? The van master interjected. The employee discount is for salaried workers only. This is why we shouldn't hire outsiders, Arthur thought. No respect for the rules. He had no want for any further confrontation, and if he was to work with this professional and survive, it was better that they leave the bay on good terms. He offered his hand up between the two in peace. I have an employee discount, Miss Duke, he said. If it is that important, it is a necessity, she corrected. If it is a necessity, then you can pay me back, and we can be on our way, Arthur replied calmly. You see that, you weird Nazi scum? Robbia spat at the van master, smoke billowing out of her mouth. That is what a reasonable, God-fearing man looks like. She jerked the clipboard out of Arthur's hand and signed the manifest furiously, not waiting to receive her carbon copy. Arthur picked the copy up off of the floor. She patted Arthur on the back. Come on now, let me let you buy a girl a drink, she said, almost flirtatiously. All eyes of the garage were on them, their suspicion piercing. Only Arthur seemed to mind their judgmental gaze as Robbia's walk became brisk, even graceful. He followed behind her, self-conscious. No one shouted in the IRS. This was a place for civility and order, a sanctuary from the heart of darkness that reigned supreme on the outside. Yet here was an outsider brought in from necessity, bred in the United Wastes and raised by its callous, cruel hand, what understanding did she have of Arthur's world? He had worked with plenty of other enforcers, and though they were a different breed from the office drones, they sure as hell weren't as mercurial as Rabia. They, like Arthur, were mostly raised in the cold and safe halls of Tax Central, 
It clearly didn't bother Rabia that their peers were looking disdainfully at them. But that's what bothered Arthur most of all. What would they think of him associating with her, even buying her what she wanted? What if they had heard he was up for a promotion, but instead was back on the road with that animal? What sort of rumors would be forged in that vacuum of information? What sort of falsities would they imagine to justify his fall from grace? It was maddening to think about. You'll have to spend a week with her, his mind volunteered, as chills and goose flesh spread across his body. I appreciated your assistance there, Robbia said happily. I'm sure with a little more abuse that coward would have bent, but you never can be too sure of the iron will of bureaucrats. They are not imaginative. If it doesn't add up on their forms, it just isn't possible. I'm a bureaucrat, Arthur replied with a mixture of pride and annoyance. I know that, but so far you are willing to buy a professional necessary supplies and a girl a drink, so you are forgiven. Robbia said with jest. My last enforcers didn't need to drink, Arthur replied coldly. What of it, huh? Did them a lot of good. All of them dead. They died in a line of duty. Bullshit, Robbia said. They died while you laid on your back trying to rob desperate people. I've been around to see this madness, been on the other side of it too. There is nothing honorable about what we do. Arthur stopped. Who does this woman think she is, he thought, not daring to say it and end this short-lived peace. We don't rob people, he said. We simply remind them of their civic duty. Civic duty? Rabia interrupted. My God, man, what civilization do you see out there? Listen, the difference between us and your average raider camp is that the raiders don't have the sense to leave their victims behind. It's a brilliant racket we got here. Take enough to make us rich, but leave them alive and with enough supplies to get more the next time we come back. It's a winning idea in the United Wastes, I'll give you that, but let's call it what it is. Without a social contract to sign, we are thieves with an ideology. I've heard that you have been with us for some time, Arthur said to Robbia's back. What happened to your other auditor? Robbia turned her head to answer, but continued forward without missing a step. Smoke covered the parts of her face that her sunglasses didn't hide. The same thing that happened to your enforcers. As your new enforcer, I recommend you stay on my good side. Arthur did what he had been doing his entire life. He followed. Begrudgingly, which is the first time he had had that feeling while doing what he was told. But he followed still. Only the best, he repeated in his mind. But this time it was far from comforting. It wasn't uncommon for an enforcer to fail at keeping their auditor alive. It happened. Yet there was nothing comforting in Rabia, nothing there to calm his fear of dying. The others had been true believers, doing their job for a civil future. In the short time he had talked with her, it was hard to say if Rabia believed in anything. He had a strange feeling that this conviction in believing in nothing meant that she would even balk at nihilism for being too idealistic. The two, neither happy for the other's company, reached the closest thing the United Wastes had to a convenience store, the IRS Wares store. In its lowest sublevel, the IRS bunker kept the cash of taxes that it collected, along with a massive amount of shrink-wrapped $2 bills. It was the largest hoard in the United Wastes and was by far the most unique. Once the IRS officially recognized the barter system that much of the United Wastes had been using, the store filled with everything from toilet paper to weapons. These ware stores served as currency exchange for the agents, allowing them to turn in their $2 bills for anything their hearts desired. The one on this floor had taken up the space of six parking spaces, with scavenged wood and steel used to partition its goods from the rest of the garage with an orderly wall. Food, feminine hygiene, bullets, and even reading material filled scavenged bookcases wall to wall, all of it guaranteed to be free from radiation. It was a tiny oasis of plenty in a world without water. Rabia looked within, lustfully. After seeing Rabia and intuiting her order, the clerk, a balding man who had never been outside of the bunker's walls, turned his back on them and gathered supplies. 
He returned with a quart of tequila, a quart of rum, two handles of wild turkey 101 bourbon, three cans of grapefruit, and a carton of smokes. All of it was older than Arthur and Robbia. You're going to have to be less particular of your bourbon, Miss Duke. We are going to run out of it at some point. There is no one left making it, the clerk said with a wry smile. There's still the irradiated stuff, she replied. And if you think for a moment that it is any more dangerous than the stuff that isn't irradiated, then you clearly have never had a drop of wild turkey yourself. A small cloud of smoke caught beneath the brim of her hat. The clerk's smile faded, and a deft hand punched a calculator at the counter. That will be $200, or an equal amount of calories and bullets, the clerk stated without looking up. Robbie had jabbed Arthur with her elbow, ushering him to fix the situation. Reluctantly, he moved forward. It is my buy today, Arthur said. The clerk looked up with muted surprise. As a non-outsider, the face value exchange will be $100, the clerk stated without checking his calculator. Arthur counted out 50 bills, and as he handed them over, Robbie has slapped him on the back affectionately. You're a good man, Charlie Brown, she said. Who's Charlie Brown? Arthur asked, confused. No idea. It was something my mother used to say. I think he was a kid who went bald from chemotherapy, back when radiation was good. Anyway, let's get a move on, Robbia said, walking away, leaving Arthur to carry everything. He quickly grabbed the heavy load in a half panic after realizing that he was going to be left behind. This wasn't fair. They should be counting their inventory, meticulously checking that everything was in its place. This wasn't just because he was orderly, to the point that it was nearly debilitating at times, but because their survival depended on it. They should be on their way to their destination, scouting for a safe camping site. Traveling at night in a vehicle was too dangerous. It made too much noise, and the headlights would be like flares leading the cruel to them. Instead, they were buying drugs. Somehow Arthur had lost control of the situation, and he was supposed to be in charge. He should have been barking orders, but instead, he buried his anger. He would straighten things up on the road, where there was no one to judge him for his outburst. Robbie Duke was the first to their van. After a pause, she slid open the door with the pomp of a magician, revealing the rations and gear leased to them. Yet that was not all that was there. A gun case of every size filled much of the van's floor, each of them labeled Escalation on strips of duct tape. The only cases without this label instead read Tools and Medicine. The latter dwarfed the toolbox. Rabia kicked its latches open. I suppose you want to count everything, she mumbled, holding up a hand, gesturing for the liquor. Arthur complied and watched as she stuffed the drinks into the case. Then he saw it. A plethora of drugs, old and new. None of them were for illness. What is that? Arthur accused. Aside from the guns and a few pipe bombs, Robbia replied. We have multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, laughers, and some bits of an unknown purple crystal I jacked from a raider, which I haven't dared to try yet. I don't actually know if you're supposed to smoke it, but judging by his bulging eyes before I killed him, I would say it's a safe bet that's what he did with it. There's also some high-powered shaman's milk in there. I'm sure the curdling doesn't matter. Some pre-war pellets of MDMA and LSD, both pure, I've tested them. Some ayahuasca, a six-pack of only the darkest beer, and a brown bottle I found on a dead woman labeled no. Before Arthur could protest, and before he could point out that it was all federally illegal, something that apparently mattered, Rabia kicked the latches back down, and looked at Arthur with intense regard. Her sunglasses were now slightly down, revealing her brown eyes. Arthur couldn't decide if it was their beauty that was seducing him, or their desperate craving for madness that they broadcast. A Cheshire cat grin spread from ear to ear, her cigarette and funny-smelling hand roll still clenched between teeth. This is going to be a wild ride, she said. About the Author M.P. Fitzgerald is an author and humorist dedicated to injecting the feverish gonzo style into fiction. You can get Memos from the Wasteland, which is the official prequel to this book, free 
It contains hilariously bleak office drama, Robbie's diary, and Arthur's last letter from his father. To get your copy, just head over to his website at mpfitzgerald.art. You'll also get free updates on future audiobooks and more. We hope you have enjoyed A Happy Bureaucracy by M.P. Fitzgerald, narrated by Gary Bennett. Text copyright 2019 by M.P. Fitzgerald. Production copyright 2021 by M.P. Fitzgerald. Music by Dust Mice. Available on all streaming services and dustmice.bandcamp.com.